this is really important. I know it sounds kind of boring to talk about this low level stuff with bits, but writing numerically precise code is actually a deep learning super skill. A lot of the time, you'll find that deep learning algorithms sort of work when you code them up. The loss will go down, the accuracy will go up, the accuracy will get within a few percentage points of the state of the art. And you can check your code really carefully and you can find that there aren't really any bugs. But maybe there are some things that aren't quite optimal about it. And that's often caused by a loss of numerical precision, where you run your gradient descent algorithm and you don't get quite as good as results as you think you should. And another time, you'll find that your deep learning algorithm explodes. You get a lot of not a number values, you get a lot of very large values. And this might happen even if you make your learning rate relatively small and you think everything should be stable. Both of these problems actually usually come from writing code that doesn't have high enough numerical precision. So being able to write numerically precise code can really differentiate how well you perform as a deep learning practitioner. A lot of people have heard the story of how when I first thought of generative adversarial nets, I was at a bar and I went home and I coded them up immediately. And you know, within an, an hour or so later, I actually had them working. A lot of people have wondered how I was able to do that. And part of the answer is that I knew about all of this really boring numerical precision stuff. So I didn't waste any time shooting myself in the foot writing numerically imprecise code. And that reduces the amount of time it takes to get the algorithm working a lot. The basic idea is that when you use a finite number of bits to represent a real number, you get both routing errors and what are called truncation errors. In a digital computer, we're usually talking about using float32 or some other similar schemes to represent real numbers. That's especially true when we're using CUDA on GPUs. Uh, sometimes we use other floating for formats. A lot of the problems I'm going to describe here will often mostly go away if you're able to switch to float64. But that usually requires uh, you know, slower computation on GPU or may even force you to move to CPU. It will also force you to use more memory. So if you can write numerically precise code using float32, then that can be a big advantage. There's basically three categories of problems that happen on, on these kinds of 32-bit of representations. So first, most numbers that you work with, they're not going to cause catastrophic problems on their own but they are going to get rounded. If you have some real number x and you turn it into a representation on computer, it's going to get rounded to some value x plus delta, where delta is just some small value describing the rounding error that happened, that you'll be off by a little bit from what you meant to be. A larger problem is when you have some extremely large value of x. You just can't represent it with the range of numbers that your float32 values can represent. And it will actually get replaced by some placeholder like inf, just saying that x is too large to represent. And so now it's not really a finite value anymore. You've got this infinite number, and your code will probably still go ahead and keep doing arithmetic on this number as if it were a real value, and then you'll get in trouble. Uh, there's another topic which is still basically a kind of rounding error, but it's a particularly harmful kind of rounding error, where if you have a very small value of x, it can get replaced by 0. This is especially harmful because a lot of the algorithms in deep learning often assume that we have some very small but non-zero variable. Like for example, if you use the logistic sigmoid activation function, uh, you can pass very negative values to the logistic sigmoid. And algebraically, they'll never become quite zero. But in a computer, they can definitely get rounded down to zero. And so people are asking, aren't these numerical issues already addressed in the current deep learning libraries? And the answer is basically yes, but you need to know when to look out for them. A lot of the time you write your own code and you might end up rewriting a version of something that already has a numerically stable variant. Uh, sometimes you might need to, for example, compute a softmax over several tensors instead of just one tensor. And you'll need to know how to do that in a numerically stable way if your library only provides a softmax for a single tensor. Um, some other people are asking if there's any pointers on the best way to deal with NANDs. That's basically what the next several slides will do. Uh, someone asks, how does the 64-bit representation solve the NAN error? Well, the basic idea is that if you have 32 bits, there's a certain range of values that you can represent. Um, if you have 64 bits, that range expands. Um, so a program that might cause a NAN when you use 32 bits might actually avoid the NAN when you use 64 bits. If you use a program that uses even bigger numbers, you can eventually still get NANs for 64 bits. It's just that uh, fewer programs cause problems using 64 bits than using 32. One example is if you look at the PyLearn2 repository that I used to work on in, in grad school before we had TensorFlow, you can look at some of the unit tests 
And when I compute the KL divergence between two Gaussian distributions, if I use float 64, the unit test expects the KL divergence to have a minimum value of zero. Um, but if I use float 32, the unit test actually has to allow the KL divergence to go slightly negative. So one example of how we can get routing errors and they can affect this code is what happens when you add a very small number to a larger number. So we're going to make an array using 32-bit floats, and we're going to store the value 0 and the value 10 to the minus 8 in this array. If we compute the argmax of this array, the argmax is 1, because position 0 has a value of 0, position 1 has a, a positive but very small value of 10 to the minus 8. So now suppose that we take these numbers and we add them to a much larger number. We add them to 1. Well, 0 is going to have 1 added to it and end up with a value of 1. Um, ideally, 1 plus 10 to the minus 8 would be represented as 1, but, or, sorry, 1, 1 point, you know, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 after the correct number of zeros. In this case, it's actually going to get rounded to 1, which isn't quite what we want. When you take the argmax of the new array, where we added 1 to it, we actually get that the argmax is 0 now, because NumPy breaks ties to uh, the first index that's tied for the max. So this um, addition of a number that caused rounding error has actually downstream changed the results quite a lot. We only really wanted to extract a single bit from this computation, and we're now actually getting the value of that bit wrong. There's some secondary effects that happen when we have rounding error and overflow and underflow errors. What happens is after the first error, we do some more math, and then the second error causes a bigger problem. So for example, say we have some code that computes x minus y. x minus y is a relatively safe thing to do to start with. Uh, there's definitely some ways that can go wrong, but there's not anything fundamentally wrong with doing a subtraction. But now suppose that x overflows to nth, y overflows to nth. Well, then we've got infinity minus infinity, and we don't really know which infinity is larger. This kind of operation is not really defined. So now our x minus y will turn these nths into nands. A lot of the time when you have overflow, the way that you first see it is that you'll get a nan in your loss function or your gradient. So somewhere in your computational graph, you'll get an nth. And then by the time it actually gets printed out or plotted somewhere, it will have been turned into a NAND by these additional steps of arithmetic that came afterward. One of the main functions that's often the culprit of numerical precision problems in deep learning programs is the exp function that, that computes the, you know, the natural logarithms base e raised to the power of x. This will overflow for large values of x. And a lot of the time when I say large values, I am talking about extremely large values. For exp, when I say large values, I'm actually talking about numbers that are not very big. If you're using float 32, a value of 89 past 2x will overflow to nth. To make sure that your program doesn't have trouble with exp, just never use large x as the argument for exp. And make sure that you design the structure of your functions that you compute so that they will never actually pass a large x to exp. A lot of the rest of this lecture will be about ideas for how you can prevent that from happening in specific cases. The other big problem with exp is that if your argument to it is very negative, exp of x can underflow. This may not be a problem. If you think about it, uh, exp of a very negative number is just some small number epsilon. And if you round that number down to 0, you've only made a mistake of size epsilon. So if that was your final output of the function, it's not a very big error. Unfortunately, if you then do other math on top of this output, rounding a small number epsilon down to 0 can be catastrophic if you're using exp of x in a denominator or as an argument to a logarithm and so on. It can cause really big problems. Another case where you can sometimes encounter danger is when you have subtraction, especially if you want to guarantee that the uh, output of the subtraction is going to be positive. So if you have two values, x and y, and you know algebraically that you can prove that x is always greater than y, in a computer, you may actually find that x minus y ends up being negative. So if you relied on x minus y being positive in subsequent steps of your program, you could run into trouble. One case where you see this a lot is computing the variance. So there's one way that you can write the variance, where it's the expectation of a squared value. If you implement the variance this way in your code, it's always going to give you positive numbers, uh, because the output of the, the squaring value will, will always be non-negative. I, I shouldn't say positive, sorry. Um, and then if you look at the difference between uh, the expectation of the squared value of the function and the square of the expected value of the function, algebraically, that's a perfectly valid way of rearranging this expression for the variance. 
And a lot of time, this is actually the one where we, we actually have access to those values to compute it. Unfortunately, it's numerically unstable, because if we have a little bit of rounding error on the left and a little bit of rounding error on the right, and these values were very close to 0 to start with, if the rounding error goes in the wrong direction, we can end up with a small negative value instead of 0. And that can cause trouble, especially if we were planning to pass this value to a square root or a logarithm later on. Logarithm and square root are also functions where you want to be very careful. The logarithm of 0 is negative infinity. And the logarithm of a negative number is imaginary. Usually in software frameworks like NumPy, we end up treating that as a not a number. Um, the square root of 0 is 0, so that's actually safe. But the derivative of square root has a divide by 0 if you take the derivative at x equals 0. So you definitely want to avoid underflow or rounding to a negative value in the argument to either log or square root. One very common place where this comes up is when we compute the standard deviation. The standard deviation is the square root of the variance. So if you compute the variance using the dangerous strategy from this slide, you can end up with this rounding to a small negative number. And then you take the square root of that small negative number and run into trouble. The logarithm of x is a, a common pattern that comes up a lot in deep learning. We often see this when we're computing log probabilities, and the probability is based on taking the x of some argument. Whenever you see this, you should simplify it to just the value x. Fiona will do this for you automatically. A lot of frameworks don't. Um, and if you do this, you can avoid overflowing the exp because you just take x rather than um, computing x of x first before computing the log. You can also avoid underflow in x, which would then cause the logarithm to, uh, to turn into negative inf. So now I have a little bit of an exercise for you. Uh, let's say that we we're doing a little bit of a hack to avoid uh, a divide by 0. We want to take a normalized, um, we want to compute a normalized version of x where x will have unit standard deviation. And we divide x by some estimate of the standard deviation in order to do that. Um, we know that our standard deviation might have some round to 0 trouble. So we're going to add a small constant epsilon of 10 to the minus 7 to our standard deviation in order to make sure we don't divide by 0 when we compute the normalized version of x. Uh, so there's two different ways we can imagine doing this. One is we could take the square root of epsilon plus the variance and use that as our standard deviation. The other version of the hack is we could take epsilon plus the square root of the variance. So which of these is the better way to implement this hack? Uh, does anybody want to answer on the chat? Uh, the first one. So why do you say the first one? Oh, we got to vote for the second one as well. So does somebody want to give, give a reason for one of their votes? So the square root of eps will be too small. That can definitely happen. If, if your eps is already just barely as big as you can represent and variance is 0, it can round down. Um, there's also another issue here, uh, which is um, think about what happens if the variance is already implemented safely, and we know that it won't get rounded down too low. Um, and let's, let's also suppose we make epsilon a little bit bigger. bigger. So if we divide by a square root of epsilon, that won't give us divide by 0. Is there any other problem that might come up here? So there is one other problem that might come up here. Um, if we use this version, uh, where we have the epsilon plus square root of the variance, uh, we can actually get, um, when we compute the derivative of normalized x later on, we can have this problem that the square root of the variance might be evaluated exactly for um, the variance being equal to 0. And when we take the derivative of square root, we actually get a divide by 0 in that case. Um, so usually you want to put the epsilon inside the square root. But you do need to make sure that your epsilon is big enough that it won't get rounded down to 0 when you take the square root. Um, another function that comes up all the time in deep learning is log sum x. Uh, you see this in things like the cross entropy function. Um, the naive way of implementing this is if you have an array, you take, you apply x to the array, then you sum out the x values, and then you take the log at the end. The failure modes to this are there's two different ways it could go wrong. One is if if any of your entries in the array is big, your x can overflow. Uh, so you just take x of some large number uh, in float 32. You know, a, a value of 90 would do this to you. Um, you you overflow. Now you've got an inf here. When you start doing arithmetic on the inf, it's probably going to turn into a nan pretty soon. Um, and that, that one's relatively obvious. A lot of people realize that that one's going to happen. 
And another case that this can fail is if all of the entries in the array are very negative, then all of the exps underflow to zero. Individually, each of these mistakes in the exp is not a big deal. You, exp of a very negative number is some small number epsilon. You round that to zero, your error is only order of epsilon. Your, your, your error is only exactly epsilon. The problem is when you sum up all those zeros, if all of them are literally zero, then the sum is also literally zero. And then you pass that to a log. So you get a negative inf at the end, even if that's not, not algebraically the correct answer. So the good news is there's a relatively simple trick that lets us fix this. Uh, the way it works is we take the maximum of the array, and then we subtract the maximum off all of the entries. Then we compute log sum x of this new safe array that had the max subtracted off of it. And we add the max back on to the result after we take the log. Uh, in TensorFlow, there's a built-in version that does this for you, uh, tf.reduce log sum x. You do need to know to use that, though. As someone was saying, don't all the deep learning frameworks already solve this? Well, a lot of them provide solutions to it, but you have to know to use those solutions. Uh, so whenever you see yourself doing a log sum x, be sure to use the stable variant of it. Uh, if we look at why this works, first off, we need to make sure that we're actually computing the value that we want. We want to see that the new expression is algebraically equivalent to the old one. So the way we can see this is we've got this variable m representing the max. We've got this vector a representing the array. Uh, the new value that we're computing is m plus log sum over i of x of a i minus m. Well, each of these x terms, we can use the fact that x of a i minus m turns into x of a i divided by x of m. And so we've simplified uh, these terms inside the sum. Now it turns out that every term in the sum has this factor uh, division by x of m, and this factor doesn't depend on i at all. So we can actually pull it outside the summation. So now we've got uh, this 1 over x m factor multiplied by this summation factor. Well, a logarithm of two factors can be split into, um, into the sum of the logarithm of both those factors. The logarithm of 1 over x is actually just negative log of x. So we get m minus log x m plus the sum over all these factors. This log x, obviously, that turns into the identity. So we get um, m minus m. This cancels. And oh, I actually have a mistake. I left out the log here. But there should be a log right there. Um, so we've actually recovered the original version of the expression that we were trying to optimize. Uh, so the other thing we need to check to see that this works is we need to make sure that the, that the two failure modes we identified earlier are gone. So we noticed that there's a way that we can overflow the original version. We've also noticed that there was a way we could underflow every term of the original version and then get a negative int when we pass it to the log. So first, let's look at the overflow case. Because we subtract off the max, all of the entries of safe array are at most 0. Uh, x of 0 is just 1, so we can compute that without any overflow. So we've eliminated the overflow problem. Next, there was the case where every value of the x underflows. Well, we can still have a problem where some of the x terms underflow. Uh, the good news is subtracting off the max actually means that there has to be at least one entry of safe array that's equal to 0. Um, any entries that were tied for the max now have a value of 0. And so those are not going to underflow when we take the x. They'll get a value of 1, and that's a nice stable value that can be computed easily. That means that the sum is now at least 1, and we can safely pass that sum to the logarithm. So someone is asking if there's any book or blog summarizing all these numerical computation problems in the context of deep learning. There are definitely uh, books about numerical computation. A lot of them don't really focus specifically on the problems that come up a lot in deep learning. Um, and I don't actually know of one that is focused in that way. I will probably write an article about it or add it to the second edition of the deep learning textbook. But I don't know of a good resource to point you to yet, other than this lecture. Uh, the softmax function comes up all the time in deep learning. We use it as the output of most neural nets uh, for classification, for generating text, for uh, selecting discrete actions in reinforcement learning agents. Um, the main advice for the softmax is that you should use your library's built-in softmax function. If you try to make your own, it's easy to mess up and get a numerically unstable version. If you do build your own, the way that you should do it is you should take the argument to the softmax, the logits, and you subtract off the maximum value before you pass it through the softmax. The reason this works is very similar to the log sum x. I won't walk through exactly what all of the, all of the justification for it is, 
but it's basically the same logic as what we just saw with log sum x. The sigmoid function is also very common in deep learning, and it's essentially the same thing as softmax. It's basically a softmax where one of the inputs is hard-coded to zero, and you pass out just one of the outputs. Uh, so once again, the recommendation is to use your library's built-in sigmoid function. If you don't, you can, you can stabilize it using the same trick as with the softmax. The cross-entropy function is the loss for most neural nets that we train, especially if you have a softmax output. Uh, everything that I say here also applies with sigmoid. Just replace the word softmax with sigmoid. Um, this is probably one of the most common things that I see people screw up in deep learning, is they implement their own cross-entropy function, and they compute it using the probabilities. They actually literally apply the softmax and then compute the loss. What you actually want to do is use the logits, the, the values output by the neural net before you get to the softmax. And you want to compute your loss in terms of those. And the reason is that the probabilities will lose gradient when the softmax saturates. And the cross-entropy function won't saturate unless you're already getting the right answer. And then you don't need any gradient because you're, you're already winning. Um, the short recommendation for how to write good code is to use a numerically stable version of the cross-entropy function that's already provided to you by your library. Uh, if you're using TensorFlow, you can use tf.nn.softmax cross-entropy with logits. If you're using another software framework, you need to be very careful and check that it actually is computing the cross-entropy using the logits rather than the probabilities. Um, a lot of frameworks screw this up and use the output of the softmax rather than the input to the softmax. It's a common enough problem that, that I've actually seen this in frameworks that I've used. If you do make your own cross-entropy function, you should use the stabilization tricks for the softmax and the log sum x that come up inside this loss function in order to stabilize it. Uh, in general, if you have some, some bugs that you're encountering, there are a few really simple strategies that you can follow to catch them. Um, one thing is that if you increase the learning rate for your gradient descent algorithm and the loss function value gets stuck, that for a very large learning rate, you find that your loss is flat over time as you take more steps. That probably means that the gradient is getting routed down to zero somewhere in your graph. So you probably are losing numerical precision and ending up with, without a gradient. Uh, otherwise, a large learning rate should make you move faster and faster and actually cause explosion rather than getting stuck. The most common way that I've seen this happen is when the cross-entropy loss is calculated using probabilities instead of logits. If the softmax rounds a probability to one or zero, then the gradient through it is gone, and you can't do very much about it. A lot of the time, people that encounter this problem with extreme values of the softmax will sort of hack around it by clipping the value of the softmax somehow or other to avoid extreme values. And that will make sure that you don't get nouns in the forward prop, like when you take a log of the softmax. But it will also mean that you get zeros in the back prop when you try to compute the gradients. So that's a really common bug. And it's pretty easy to identify by the, by the learning curve being flat. Um, I've actually seen this a lot in, in like uh, third party open source implementations of generative adversarial nets. And this is one of those cases where it'll look like you don't have a bug, because if you use a small enough learning rate, your code will basically work. Um, but it just won't perform quite as well as it ought to. And if you use a large learning rate, then, then it'll break. And it will look like the algorithm is not robust to hyperparameters. But, but really, the problem is that your, your code is not numerically precise enough to handle some of the larger, larger learning rates. Another one of the bug hunting strategies I use is just if you see an explosion, immediately become very suspicious of anywhere that you see a log x square root or division in your code. And just look and see if you're doing a divide by 0, a square root of a negative number, an x of a large number, and so on. Also, you should always suspect the code that has changed the most recently. So for example, if you were running your code and everything's fine, and then eventually you add something like batch norm, and suddenly you see explosion, then you should probably suspect that maybe the problem is when you divide by the square root of the variance in your batch norm. And, and that's very likely to be where the problem is. Um, a lot of the time, I, I find that when I'm helping people like interns or brain residents, uh, just following this bug hunting strategy with my colleagues at Google Brain will help me almost immediately solve problems that were very mysterious for someone who is new to deep learning. And if you can learn this pattern, it can accelerate your workflow quite a lot. OK, thanks. Glad you enjoyed the talk. Mm -hmm.